Hmm. Go figure, huh? My name is Zach. I'm your cult boyfriend, and this is Gilmore Girls Season 4 Analysis. I definitely have quite a bit to say. Holy mother of pearls. I just finished the season maybe 30 seconds ago. Whoa! Okay. Okay. Cool ending. I'm so down with this. I'm telling you, okay? For the first 20 to 21 episodes, I, I, I did not know if it was good. In fact, I was fairly positive that it wasn't. Everything made sense in the season finale. It's a very interesting season, but it's also oh, an incredibly aggravating experience. It is irritating. It is just riddled with cliches. And it's also genius. I'll explain. This is the Yale season or whatever. This is when they when Rory goes to college. And um geez. You know what? Let me get this part out of the way. If you watch my Gilmore Girls uh videos, you know that I I may be your cult boyfriend, but I am Paris Geller's cult husband forever. I run the cult of Geller. Paris Geller, um, Sarah Michelle Geller, even, you know. Wow, just, like, stay, stay on track, your cult boyfriend. I love Paris Geller. She's the best. Um, she's incredible. She's hilarious. Um... But the thing that's most interesting about her is the way that uh, Gilmore Girls in the first three seasons would often have her attack the the meta narrative of circumstance and, and get really mad and bratty and pouty about it, which made her to me like a perfect postmodern brat and a rebel in a really driven and ironic way. I loved her. She is my ironic postmodern queen of the damned. Season four, she is kind of reserved to just comedy. I feel like... I feel like she was just misused this entire season. Liza Weil is incredible. She has hilarious jokes, great moments. Um, she, she's beautiful, and I love her personality. I love her character, so I do love being around her. But her arc, her storyline this season was just terrible, vacuous, um, fucking idiotic, to be honest. And I thought like, insulting to her character, because this was a character who they did like these postmodern acrobatics with these like high wire balancing acts of, of meta narratives for the first three seasons and then season four she is in the kirk and michelle uh territory of this is just funny now and i uh she's in love with michael york this season who i mean is, is an actor who i generally like uh that the show does ask you how you feel about uh this kind of age difference now i'm no prude i'm okay with age differences but but you filthy fuck fucks man you're making me stutter because i'm uncomfortable Paris Geller is 19 years old, and they say it over and over again that Michael York's professor is uh, 60. So, um, am I cool with not only the power dynamic of that relationship, but also the 40-plus year age difference? No, that's gross, guys. That's gross. Paris deserves a proper prince, all right, or even a king but not some, some old, dying, pretentious fool who abuses his position of power to take advantage of young women. And also Paris Geller, she said it best. Like, I know when people are manipulating me. She said this in season three about Jamie, about um, when her and Rory were being manipulated against each other over the Jamie situation. She, she told Rory, like, yeah, I know that that girl was just manipulating me. I know when I'm being manipulated. I know when I'm being, like, um, I know when I'm not in control. And I just wish Paris Geller would understand that this relationship she has with this guy, I don't believe it's equal footing. It, it can't be equal footing. He's fucking 60. He's gross. And apparently he does this with, like, a new girl every semester. I just, Paris Geller 
Geller would not be an easy mark. Um, Paris Geller would be using the fuck out of him and n not seem so like pitifully devoted to this relic. I guess I, I get that we all have our kinks and our interests and our attractions, but this one I feel like was primarily used simply for an invisible unheard laugh track that like they were all hitting these jokes that I just didn't find very funny because I found a lot of dignity and integrity in Paris and it sadly really wasn't available here. Not that the relationship was undignified. It's just that it was simply for comedy. Like her character, her entire arc, even when Michael York's character ends up in the hospital and she's like, I'm going to break up with him. It's not and she doesn't. She ends up going to, to Oxford with him for the summer. Gross. I'm going to throw up all over the place. Watch out. But it's not like an emotional moment. Not really. Not 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 when she's like, ah, he just looks so old. It's all these old jokes, all this stup stupid jokes. Like, isn't it hilarious that Paris finds Rory's grandfather hot? No. <laughs> no, that's not funny. It's not funny. I want Paris to attack meta narratives. I want Paris to be this this postmodern time bomb and just explode all over everyone and not care who's in her way or how many casualties befell her tirade. I love Paris, and I think that this season is just kind of insulting to to this character who I saw beautifully designed and composed throughout the first three seasons being limited and marginalized to, yes, a Kirk or a Michelle kind of um, character uh, device or, you know, no, a, a character type. Speaking of time bomb, though, let's talk about Lane. I do love that we see Lane in the first season skanking in Rory's room to rancid's time bomb black coat black shoes black hat cadillac yeah the boys of time bomb that's how he sings trust me look it up but i love the song and i and i love the image of lane skanking rebelliously in the most innocent possible form of rebellion ever skanking to time bomb in, in rory's room when they were like 16 or 17 and then in this season i think you see the culmination of that with her on a stage at a rock club living her dream big old smile on her face sebastian box in the fucking band now the head the front man's name is zach because that's what cool people People are named. Um, I miss Adam Brody a lot, but regardless, she's on that stage and and they're playing Time Bomb. They're playing Black Coat, Black Shoes, Black Hat, Cadillac, like, yeah, the boys of Time Bomb. And she just seems so fucking happy. Lane, I thought, got a lot more to do this season. Well, maybe not like a lot more to do. Lane had some interesting things to do this season like in uh, season three i think was her at her most um gripping for me but that might be primarily because i think adam brody is a brilliant actor and dave was uh, a purely delightful character and the chemistry that lane and dave uh, expressed and had is just one of a kind i thought it was pretty top notch and i, I loved seeing them together this season we see the the tear, the final breakaway, Lane being kicked out of her house um, by her abusive, shockingly abusive mother. Another situation that's just played for laughs instead of integrity, but they try to have their cake and eat it too with this situation here because they're like, but don't you see Lane's mother is a great person? And I'm like, no, 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 no. I said this on the last um season analysis as well after like 50 episodes or so believe it or not child abuse loses all of its charms i know it's difficult to really believe but it's a fact i don't like mrs kim i think she's a fucking bitch and i would punch her in the face if i had a chance lane is probably like one of the most like precious preciously rebellious like teenagers ever and she should have been able to fucking live her life date cute boys like adam brody without having to hide everything express herself find herself without this religious and cultural indoctrination um brainwashing it was ridiculous so i don't care that her mother comes back at the last minute to be like i'm just imagining your new roommates are girls and we're going to like i don't know uh clean your new apartment fuck you fuck you lane lane is too good 
for that. This show is too good for that. Come on. I don't care about like cultural differences when it comes to, okay, if, if, if a defining facet of your culture is being like psychologically tormented, like tormenting your kids, then lose that. <laughs> Fucking lose it and shame it if you're going to show it in a television show and definitely don't humanize it and certainly don't make so many fucking jokes about it. Just ceaseless. Lane also deserved better. Lane and Paris deserved a lot better. Paris, I just wish she was just more complicated, more rich, more detailed because, yeah, I felt like every scene with her, like, she's funny. Um, Liza Weil is an, 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 has extraordinary comedic timing, but I felt like every scene with her, it was like a scene with Michelle or, or Kirk. It was just a scene of comedy. Don't examine it too thoroughly. It's just Paris being fucking mean with no interiority. Not really. Um, not when I don't take this Michael York relationship seriously at all, because... Uh, I think it's unfounded, and I think it's um, it's another thing that's kind of crippling her character development here. First three seasons of Paris Geller is perfect. She is still my favorite character. Ride or fucking die, Paris Geller gang, rise up. But um, season four is uh, an, an insult to Paris Geller and to me. Let's talk about where it gets brilliant, shall we? Brilliantly aggravating. Okay, season four. Is it a good season? Yes. 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 That was pretty difficult to say. Because I'm not really sure if it even wants to be brilliant. I think it wants to be good television. You know, I don't know if it wants to be brilliant, but it's fucking brilliant. Let's talk about deliberate aggravation, shall we? I said at the end of the last season that I feel like the screwball comedy framework that Gilmore Girls was born of is kind of limiting and restricting, holding a lot of characters and situations back from reaching a truly dramatic and emotional potential. And I, th I said um, what they're going to have to do, they're going to have to abandon that or deconstruct it or destroy the frameworks of it. Um, if, if they're going to continue in the screwball comedy direction, it's just a bunch of it's a huge design flaw and the show will cave in on itself i also did say that amy sherman paladino the showrunner is definitely a lot smarter than me and she proved that to me here because she just kept going in the same fucking direction right she kept going into screwball comedy so let's try to break this down let me refer to my notes here ah uh, season four um, at the end of season four, one of Paris and Rory's roommates uh, introduces her boyfriend, and he only speaks in, like, he lost a bet, so he only speaks in cliches, you know, like, lips that touch wine are no friend of mine, you know, eye roll inducing cliches. Um, I felt like season four also lost a bet, and it spoke only in cliches. In fact, it may be in defense of them. Luke and Jess both read and study and learn from self-help books about love. Those god-awful tomes full of cliches. And they learn from them and they act them out. With Jess, it's partly an attempt for the screwball comedy, for that kind of more wholesome philosophical framework of Gilmore Girls to domesticate the truthful rebel. Guess what backfires in his face? Because Rory is on a different wavelength, but we're saving that queen for last. Let's talk about Luke and Lorelai, because we finally saw them kiss. We finally saw them date, and whoa, whoa. That was in the final episode, so I'm saying in the final episode, it made, like, so many things right. And I got teary-eyed, because they did it so right. They're like, um, like, just, because he's the one who goes in for the first kiss. And she's like, what, what are you doing? And he's like, can you just stand still? And they kiss, and they part, and then... Lorelai goes in, and then now he moves back, and she goes, can you just stand still? And that's fucking perfect, uh, my, my hand <laughs> reenactments. Don't do it justice, trust me. If, you, if you're a Gilmore Girls fan, I'm sure it's burned into your memory in a really good way, as if, like, written in your brain like lightning. I loved that moment so much. But in that, in, in that moment, um, 
Luke is really upset because Jason Stiles is there. And Jason just told Luke that, like, yeah, we're dating, so blah, blah, blah. And Luke is like, what? I finally listened to the books. I finally went up and expressed myself in actions. You know, uh, I, I no longer treat um, uh, affirmations of of intimacy and, and attraction as, as currency to be paid back or in full or owed. He's like, I read these books. I read the books on cliches. I did everything they said. I did everything my arc as a character demanded. I did everything our arc demanded. Everything the meta narrative predetermined. I did everything that the cliches told me to do. And it's supposed to be working. And guess what? The cliches worked. Jason Stiles is played by Chris Eigman. And that was such a treat. Such a lovely surprise. I love Chris Eigeman, and I haven't loved him for too long, to be honest. Just in the last year, I finally saw for the first time the Witt Stillman masterpieces, Metropolitan, Barcelona, and The Last Days of Disco. All three of those are some of my new favorite films, and Chris Eigeman is possibly the best parts of almost all of them. Right, he's definitely the best part of Metropolitan and the best part of Barcelona. But, you know, Kate Beckinsale is really too hot for Chris Eigenman to be the best part of The Last Days of Disco. And I'm sure Chris Eigenman would understand my apprehension to giving him that title. But Chris Eigenman is always fascinating in Whit Stillman films. Um, incredible actor. And also, Whit Stillman, um, you may think that Gilmore Girls uh, demands a lot of fast talking, a lot, a lot of... Uh, you know, rapid speed, rapid fire dialogue, but you ain't seen nothing until you've seen a well written Whit Stillman conversation. Okay, uh, <laughs> if there's anyone who can step up to 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 Lauren Graham, to Lorelai Gilmore at her fastest, at her wittiest, at her most absurdic, at her most acerbic, I can't even speak. If there's anyone who can stand up to Lauren Graham at her most fast-talking, most acerbic, most hyper-articulate in the use of the most flowery language possible, it is Chris Eigeman. It is the muse of Whit Stillman. Chris Eigeman meets Miss Graham on every single level, and boom, 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 he's right there, and it, it's like, wow, Gilmore Girls have finally met their match in the form of, of possibly the best orator, the best performer of Whit Stillman um, dialogue, which is also an incredibly rapid fire while, while trying to express worlds of emotion and metaphor and postmodern concepts. Uh, Chris Eigeman is great in this show. I kept waiting for the other shoe to drop, though, because I didn't, like, he doesn't thing about Chris Eigeman is that there's always, uh, and I think Whit Stillman explode, exploited this, um, and Gilmore Girls honestly didn't, uh, there's always something untrustworthy about his mannerisms, about his demeanor, about his um, presence. There's always, there's something that is angsty, like angsty eternal, and also something that is kind of duplicitous in his nature when it comes to characterization and acting and i kept waiting for the other shoe to drop i'm like so when's jason gonna turn into like a backstabbing psychopath or an obsessive or something weird? and he never really did um i do have complaints about character in that it feels like a weird it's not a lost opportunity because they certainly capitalized on a lot of the strengths that Chris Eigenman has a, a, as an actor and I did appreciate um Lauren Graham and Chris Eigenman together they have an interesting chemistry I wouldn't call it a romantic chemistry but I would call it definitely an artful one so I liked seeing them together but I wanted there to be something a bit more disagreeable um a bit more, uh, just fucking mean about uh, Digger, about Digger Styles. I wanted Chris Eigenman's performance to be a lot more pompous and a, a, a lot more two-faced. Because I feel like that's in his character, like, and, and selfishness. Like, 
Every character Chris Hageman plays perfectly is a pretty selfish and angsty and truthful one. That that's that's the balancing act you have to do with a good Chris Hageman role, which I guess only Whit Stillman can write. Jason Styles is like an uh, is not an okay character. If he wasn't played by Chris Eigman, I wouldn't be talking about him at all right now because it's just a pointless one. Um it the 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 corporate warfare and like 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 the, the casual deceit and treachery from from Richard Gilmore and his new business partner Jason Styles like that, that really doesn't open up too many doors for me to analyze because it's it's just dumb, and like Lorelai Gilmore continues to be incredibly selfish, turning that entire situation into her and her relationship. Like, that kind of stuff is just still irritating to me. So even if I were to analyze the corporate warfare, um, it would just have to lead back to a very selfish position that the show has taken involving its protagonists. And the, and with Lorelai, it just, it's just uninteresting. Uh, I loved seeing Chris Eigenman. I thought he did a, a really great performance, but I thought the character was lacking some essential qualities to make the character at all gripping because he wasn't in the end. Emily Gilmore is still like low-key my second favorite character for sure i love her to death paris geller and um emily gilmore for life certainly let's talk about rory because someone just woke up okay someone just arrived to teen drama and her name's rory fucking gilmore the show did something radical and I mean radical in an extremist way. I mean radical in a bonkers fashion. It had Rory do something intensely disagreeable. And it was plotted so well. She loses her virginity. She sleeps with Dean. Dean, a married man, got married this season. We even see Rory crying unseen at his wedding. We see um, mostly with Luke as, an, as accompaniment for this uh, proxy for viewer. Um, Dean is often talking about Rory and kind of embarrassed and ashamed for doing so. And Luke is there each time. I mean, like I said, as us, as a viewer stand in. Uh, so we know something's weird there. Jess shows up a few times. Love seeing Milo. Very cute kid. And a great performance. Great performance. Before I get into what I want to get into with Rory, just a side note, it's one thing to see Lorelai and Luke finally kiss, which is amazing. And it's almost equally as amazing to see Luke and um, Jess finally look each other in the eyes and be like, I'm thankful you're in my life and I like you. That's a huge moment too, and I'm glad we got it. Uh, but Jess shows up and bears his all to Rory, tells her that he loves her. Come away with me. I don't know where. Let's just go on a beautiful Dharma Bums type romantic adventure excursion. Please, let's do this. And Dean's there when when this happens. She turns Jess down. It's a truly idiotic move. <laughs> but it's just the appetizer. The main course is the fact that she sleeps with Dean and Dean is married. And she seems proud about it up until, I mean, the season ends with her crying, but her denial, like she seems proud. Uh, Lindsay is not right for Dean. I'm right to have done this, mom. Fuck off, mom. And he wants me. He took his wedding ring off. Whatever. It is such a disagreeable thing. And, and the look of shame and shock and sadness on, um, on Lorelai's face is I could I could surrender to to the performances of, of the two leads in, in the final few minutes of this season. It's um it's of a caliber that I haven't seen yet on this show. It's it's extraordinarily well done. Alexis Bladell, Lauren Graham in the final few minutes of this show remind me that I don't know Gilmore Girls as well as I think I do. This show loves its two leads. It thinks that Lorelai is a fucking superhero. And up until then, it thought Rory was too. Or it at least thought that it did a good job of making me believe that she was infallible. Or she's not. Now, is this a reason to hate Rory? 
absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Do I hate her? No, I'm thrilled by this. I love that this happened. This is perfect. I was <laughs> getting worried because Jess, the wrecking ball of the show, is hardly in it. Who needs Jess when you have Rory when she's horny? She just leveled the entire Star's Hollow moral framework. The ethical scope of Gilmore Girls that I thought was a bit leaning towards puritanical, and I kind of still do, <laughs> is being challenged by its, um, its paragon of virtue, Rory Gilmore. And that's incredible to see. And look, I would never do it. You know, you don't sleep with someone's wife. You don't sleep with someone's husband. Um, something I wouldn't do either is ever fucking get married as a teenager. That was an an equally idiotic decision. And Dean is definitely an unhappy person. Rory is an incredibly selfish one because she's still growing up. Dean is also selfish. Let's not let him... Let's not let him off of the betrayal part of this, you know? Boredom can only justify so much, and it certainly can't justify cheating. I don't hate either of them. Can you hate Rory? Yes. Should you hate Rory? That's what's interesting, right? What, like, what does Gilmore Girls think you should do? Like, does Gilmore Girls think you should hate her for this? Even though she does realize that what she did was awful, in the final seconds of the show where she cries outside when she calls Dean and Lindsay answers and he hears she hears her voice and she breaks down. You know, like. This is like Gilmore Girls has given us a moral framework here. Remember when and I got really pissed off about this in my last analysis video when. um Lorelai overhears Paris telling Rory that she lost her virginity to Jamie, and then she also hears that Rory is still a virgin at that point, and then Lorelai literally says to herself, I have the good kid, and I wanted to yank her by the fucking throat, uh, choke her through my television screen, because that's so puritanical. You have a good kid, because Paris had sex with a boy once. I thought that was really weird, and I thought that it was adjusting to a rather warped and very conservative ethical lens that I didn't really think fit in with the certain kind of radical feminist core that this show really does have at its best, at its most inspired. That framework is now being attacked. Stars Hollow is being attacked. The screwball comedy is being attacked by its fucking, by its, its symbol, by its living, by the symbol of its living poetry, by Rory Gilmore. And now, Lorelai, do you still think you have the good kid? And this is all deliberate. This isn't me outsmarting the show and being like, aha, you fucking contradicted yourself. No, this is planned out. Let me remind you, showrunner Amy Sherman Palladino, a lot smarter than your cult boyfriend. Trust me, I know this. I, this is so well done. It's so well done because it's an ethical dilemma with an easy... It's, 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 it's easy to choose whose side to be on here. And it's not Rory's. It's not Rory's. Because you should also honestly be mad that Rory said no to Jess. And you should also project onto this situation with Dean. Um, her being furious at Jess's wild sense of romantic freedom. And Rory's cowardice to go with him. You know, you should project some of that there because Jess and Rory, and I'm sure the showrunners see this, everyone, it's impossible. It's unavoidable. Jess and Rory have amazing chemistry. The best chemistry on the show will always be between Milo and Alexis. It's amazing chemistry. And you should, you should be worried about her right then and there when she says no to Jess. You're like, she's not thinking right. There's something... She's having a breakdown, a breakdown of character, a breakdown of archetype. I wanted the show to destroy certain parts of the screwball comedy framework because I thought it was holding it back. Well, it took an entire 22 more episodes to get there, but my God, in the final 15 minutes of the series, of the season finale of four, 
really put Rory Gilmore in a bad, bad light, a bad corner, a bad place. And Alexis Bledel committed to it so well. And Lorelai, Lauren Graham committed to it even further. I can't get that look of shock and disappointment. And it was true. Right? Because we know, we know the moral landscape of Lorelai Gilmore. It's um, reflective of uh, the transparent one that uh, Stars Hollow has. What Rory and Dean did is an unforgivable act in Stars Hollow. Um, and for a lot of us in the real world, I mean, this is incredibly selfish. I've said it since the beginning. And it's cool to see that with Rory, that those selfish qualities, they aren't just being championed anymore. Now they've been, they, it's beyond being weaponized. Um, a time bomb has been detonated. Like it, it, it was set, it was wired in the episode uh, of season four when they first run into each other and Dean's like, I'm getting married today. That's when the bomb was set and it was just ticking down. We even got time bomb. We, have, we had these references to time bombs, to explosions, to dry spells. And it exploded, didn't it? And I don't think that the screwball comedy framework can survive this kind of blast. All right, what Rory did was insane, and I am thrilled. Thank God, Rory. Rory, you ruled this season by being completely sucky. Okay? I'm so happy about that. Guys, guys. Season four is good and it's bad. And I wouldn't have it any other way. Lie, lie, liar. Paris Geller deserves dignity. Season five better have a a well-considered, thought out, and plotted, and detailed, um, multifaceted arc for Paris. Or else I'll 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 fucking get really mad. Um But Rory Gilmore. It's like we were watching like the origin, like the evolution of a of a television villain here. And like it all makes sense. All these like micro punishments that, that Rory was 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 seeing, these microaggressions from from college, people being kind of rude to her, people being kind of dismissive, her dry spell, her failure, her romantic failings, like all of these little things were building up to a moment, to an explosion with Dean and a huge betrayal, the biggest betrayal that we've seen thus far on Gilmore Girls. And Rory was like so defiant, so self-righteous. In the face of her mother's sh uh, sh shock and awe, like she, Rory Gilmore, this was a great season of television because by the end of it, you realize that Rory Gilmore was the antagonist of the entire season, and then and then you look at that narrative and you you go, I see it, I see it, and that's so cool. Rory Gilmore was a great villain; she did so well this season. I was thrilled by her and. I was surprised by her. Good, good stuff. Really good stuff, actually. The more that I think about it, um, the most aggravating thing to watch, because, yeah, it's 21 and a half episodes of build up until Alexis Bledel finally, finally fucking just turns and Rory Gilmore becomes the screwball comedy villain. I didn't even know was possible. It's a great postmodern season of television. I think that's it for now. I'll be back to talk about season five. Who the fuck knows where we're going? I'm always wrong when it comes to my my predictions about Gilmore Girls, right? Um, I'm always right in my analysis. My insight's always top notch, but I I, I can never gauge where we're going because um. Amy Sherman Palladino is a fascinating creator, writer, and showrunner, and who the fuck knows where we're going? Does she even want to make brilliant television, or is that just like a byproduct of making watchable TV within a certain kind of context? Like, I don't know. She's really fascinating, and I can't wait to um, discuss 
let's let's turn more with you guys. Thank you for watching. Definitely, I'm your cult boyfriend, and yeah, thank you for watching my video. It really means a lot. Thank you.